2008. Through his work at the center, Greg has had the opportunity to design numerous stormwater retrofits and develop stormwater regulations and guidance manuals for several states and communities. So Greg is a graduate of Michigan Tech University and he would be happy to discuss all things stormwater with you. But as a native Wisconsinite, would be just as happy discussing his beloved Green Bay Packers. Sadly, that's gonna have to wait till next year now, Lee. So I've only got stormwater on my mind today. My Packers are no longer playing. Um, so stormwater it is today. Okay. <laughs> so design with maintenance in mind. I'm going to start out with the take home points. So if you know all these three, these four things already, maybe I don't have much to share with you, but I think I might have a few tidbits. One, many BMP maintenance problems are actually design problems. Two, many BMP maintenance problems are actually programmatic problems. We'll get into more details on both of those. Number three, sediment never disappears on its own. There is no BMP that disappears the sediment for us, so we need to plan accordingly. And number four, pretreatment is essential. Keep those in mind as we go through my presentation today. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about, or at least a lot of the photos I'm using came from a study that CWP did all the way back in 2009, one of the first uh, projects I did um, when I started working at CWP. And this was called the um, James River BMP survey, where several CWP staff spent uh, around a week in the field looking at many different BMPs in communities in the James River watershed in the middle of Virginia to see you know, how they're going. They had been in place for a while. What do the BMPs look like now? So we picked out about 200 BMPs to survey, did a visual screening of each of them, and tried to take a rep representative sample of what was out there, including infiltration and bioretention and wetlands and swales and so on, looking at eight different communities in the basin. And we looked at installation quality, placement and integration into the site, sizing, flow path, stability, vegetative health, soil texture, maintenance, and overall performance. And looking at all of those things, some things were hard to tell just from visual assessment, but we did get a sense of the overall health of the BMPs. With that study, this is question one. There's going to be lots of questions in my presentation today. What percent of the BMPs we found do you think showed signs of a lack of maintenance? I've got 75%, 95%. Apparently the Delaware River doesn't do maintenance as well as Virginia. 70, 75, okay, we have some consistency. It was actually a little less than you're guessing, which is good news, I think. It was about 50% of the BMPs we surveyed showed visible signs of excess sediment, clogging, erosion, vegetation problems, trash, structural degradation, or flow alteration. Um, that doesn't mean that you know some of the others didn't were getting all the maintenance they need, but at least visually we couldn't couldn't say there's an obvious maintenance problem here. So what was wrong with some of the um, some of the things we've seen and in general, when we're talking about design problems, I'm going to cover these seven bullets uh, with you know design issues that lead to maintenance problems, visibility, access, pretreatment, clogging, micrograding might be my favorite run compaction and sedimentation, and planting plants. First problem, visibility and access. One of the things we found that is clearly a design problem is that BMPs that were less visible to the property owners 
were not maintained as well. And we even found some like this that had a fence around them with no gate. So they were not only not visible, but not accessible at all. How about this one? What, so seems like a pretty obvious issue to me that I don't wanna be the person responsible for maintaining this BMP and keeping that overflow clear. It also seems that no one else wants to be responsible for maintaining this BMP and keeping it clear. So how is this a design issue? What could we have, did, if you were the designer for this wet pond, what would you have done differently to make this not such a maintenance problem? Feel free to chat or just speak it out. I'm good with either. Very good. We always, for some reason, want to put the overflow in the middle of our pond. And there is no reason we can't put overflow devices built into the slope or at least along the sides. So, I mean, at the very least, put it within a rake distance from, from dry land. So this, you know, life would be a whole lot easier for whoever had to maintain this if they could just walk up on the grass and clear this out rather than having to swim out there. All right, this one's a little sneakier. Um, I've got an issue with the um, the little standpipes here that are the maintenance ports for the bioretention underdrain. Anyone have any thoughts on what my issue is with this? If you don't, I'll tell you, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. Good, mature vegetation will obscure the view. Any others? Tough to access once plants have grown. Access for cleaning. Will get buried in mulch. Sometimes the cleanout tops are not watertight, so the over, the uh, observation structure is short circuited. Mulch is high on rear, below the overflow. So all of these were good ones. Bianca had it. The one that uh, makes me the most annoyed is that these observation wells are below the overflow. If this bioretention area is dry, that is a good sign it's functioning properly. And I probably don't even need to look at these observation wells. The only time I'd wanna look at these observation wells is if this bioretention area is not draining. And if it's not draining, water is gonna rise up to the elevation of this overflow. And these two observation wells will be completely underwater. So how am I gonna look in there and see if the underdrain is clogged? If I can't find them, and if when I do find them, all the water in this fire retention starts pouring down those pipes. And you can see this is a standard detail I took from a community I work in, where it says, put this observation well six inches above grade. Well, what it really should say is put this observation well six inches above whatever the top of ponding is, because if the ponding's 12 inches or 18 inches, this is going to be underwater. So this is a big one for me. If we're putting in things to help us with maintenance, make them accessible. Next design problem, pre-treatment. I'm very excited to see this one. And Kate is going to talk more about this particular community, Lancaster. But I love the photos from it, so I had to steal a few. Very excited to see their pre-treatment in this curb bump out bioretention area. I'd be less excited to be the maintenance person in this. They put the gravel in there. It's now filled with sediment. That's gonna be a little bit hard to clear out without a major project. On the other hand, a pre-treatment design like this with a nice concrete base in there, that I'd be excited about taking a shovel to and very quickly pulling the sediment out of the four bay. So 
the maintenance problem of this pretreatment clogging up and eventually this sediment's gonna, more sediment coming in is gonna head to my bioretention area can be addressed with a design fix of a better pretreatment design. Here's another pretreatment. Um, do we like this pretreatment design? Do we not like this pretreatment design? What do you think? I like some things about it and I dislike some things about it. Any thoughts? Below the overflow, hard to clean. I would agree that the gravel over or the stone over here is going to be very hard to clean. I might disagree that say this in the parking lot is pretty easy to clean. It can be done with a shovel. Any other thoughts? Agreed, the crushed stone will fill retention spaces. So another issue I have with this one is the sediment's clearly dropping out in the parking lot, not in the BMP, which may be fine, but if sediment's dropping out here, that means every time it rains, there's standing water here. And that might not be a design aesthetic you wanna see. Most designers will want the sediment to drop out in, in or near the BMP, not in the parking lot itself. So I like the cleanability of this. I could get all this dirt up real fast, um, on the other hand, I think my property owner is going to be annoyed with me if this parking space is underwater every time it rains. So a few more thoughts on pre-treatment. Plan for sedimentation. We are designing a four bay or any other type of pre-treatment to capture the sediment. It's going to hold on to it, so we're going to need to remove it later. So. Think about overbuild for loss of depth over time, meaning you don't have to maintain it as often. Plan for that accumulation at inlets. Consider this is more of a pond thing than a small BMP issue, but sedimentation rods in pretreatment areas will tell you how quickly the sediment's filling up. And then do your best to make sediment removal simple. Um, Here's a four bay that's very accessible from either side. This one even has an ex access road to the four bay before this pond. I could, you know, it takes a bigger project because it's a big BMP, but I could get a truck down there or an excavator down there to scoop up the sediment from this particular four bay. All right, next. Next design problem, clogging. Um, just have one picture on this, but this one happens a lot. Someone designed a pond and they did their calculations and the calculations said the orifice needed to be two inches in order to detain water long enough, which is great. They put in their two inch orifice, but it feel, seems to me like this hole could get clogged by about three leaves coming into our dry pond and suddenly it's no longer a dry pond, it's a wet pond and it's not functioning like it is. So a single hole outlet, especially a small one can be a real problem for ponds. Better to put a perforated pipe around this and extend it out, cover it in gravel so our orifice is still there, but there's multiple ways for water to get into that orifice rather than just one hole at the end. There was a question in here asking, what are sedimentation rods? A sedimentation rod looks kind of like a permanent survey rod or a stream gauge. It is just a rod you permanently place in the um, four bay that has you know, graduated marks on it for inches or feet. And it will tell you, you know, when you look at it, say, oh, the sediment's up to six inches or it's up to a foot and a half, um, then you can figure out how quickly does sediment um, fill up, how often do you need to start to plan to get out there and remove the sediment. Next design problem, as I said, my favorite, micro-grading. This is both a design and a construction problem often. Um, this picture on the left, a little hard to see in the photo, but all this water was meant to go through these curb cuts into this sort of BMP over here. 
but when they paved the site with asphalt, everything was a little higher by the curb and all the water actually started running down this way and all went in and overwhelmed one of the curb cuts. Sure, that's a construction issue um, that maybe the contractor didn't do it exactly right, but a better design and better notes on the design saying we need to make sure water spreads out evenly and make sure we have flow to each of these inlets would give the con contractor a better chance of constructing it the way we wanted to see it. This photo on the right is an even worse example. Uh, here's our curb cut. Here's our infiltration trench. Sadly, it is very difficult to get water to run uphill. So getting water from this uh, curb cut into this infiltration trench just isn't possible. Now, maybe that was a construction issue, maybe it was a design issue, but I, I maintain that all construction issues are design issues, that there wasn't enough notes on there, enough clear grading to say, um, enough clear grading to say that this infiltration trench needs to be lower than this inlet point. Uh, question on there, do I recommend specifications that test the flow after construction to ensure proper construction? I'm going to give that a qualified yes. Um, I think there is times that it makes sense to test the flow. Um, what I really, really like for to go on plans is what's referred to as an as-built table. I, you know, the plans say what elevations you want to everything at. Um, but if you put an as-built table that says, here are the five things that have to be a certain way, like the overflow has to be at elevation X and the bottom of the buyer retention has to be at elevation Y and the inlet point has to be between those two elevations. Have that as a check off for the designer to say what those elevations are the contractor to check off that they met those elevations, not just with a check mark, but with an actual number. And then ideally the community inspector would also check those off saying, yep, I looked at the inlets, I looked at the outlets, they met the elevations that the design set it with. I am a big fan of the as-built table to be the final check that says, yes, this BMP works the way it was intended to work. I think I have another micrograding picture coming up. All right, so what's the issue with this particular BMP? We have a very nice grass swale. We put some pretreatment stone. We've already covered the difficulty of cleaning out pretreatment stone. We'll let that slide for now. Um, and I gave away this one with the bullet, with the leader already. The top of the stone is at the curb cut. This stone, fills up that curb cut. And yes, water will seep in, but eventually sediment is going to collect out here rather than in the BMP um, like was intended. Next, compaction and sedimentation. I assume some of you are looking at this one and say, what are you talking about? This is a construction issue. There's there's construction vehicles driving in my infiltration basin. That's a problem for the contractor. That's not the designer's fault. Um, agree, disagree, or better yet, I maintain it's the designer's fault too. What could the designer do differently to make sure this doesn't happen? Think about construction access, very good. Specifications, also good. The design doesn't allow for access by contractor vehicles. Fence off the area. All of those are good and should be in the plan. Specify timing of construction materials. So several things happened here. It appeared, we only have one photo, so we can't see everything, but it appears not a lot of space was given for equipment to work around there. Makes me happy to see the forest being protected, but some planning for construction staging needs to be in there. Someone said specifications, I like that one. 
If you don't want construction vehicles in your infiltration trench or your buyer retention area, then you need to specify either in the spec book or on the plan saying, if you're someone who really likes really detailed specifications, you can say, I want this built with a long armed excavator so you don't drive in it. If you're someone who says, I don't deal with the means and methods of contractors, then you just say, I want this built without any construction equipment driving in it. You figure out how to make that happen. Either way is fine, but if we don't want, compact, if we can't handle compaction from construction vehicles in our BMP, we need to make that clear to the contractor and the design plans are the way to do that. All right, planting plan, my last design issue. Right plant, right place should be the mantra of anyone designing BMPs. And I think Kate can talk about that a little more too um, when she's up. But some things to think about with BMPs. Is there deer pressure? Soil type and drawdown time. Is this gonna be a generally wet BMP or a generally dry BMP? Sun versus shade. What's the adjacent vegetation like? Do we have some height limitations we need to worry about? Salt loading or water velocity in our BMP. Here's some that look okay, but I don't love. Um, any thoughts on these two photos? What could we do better from a planting plant point of view? Native plants. There's. This one's in Virginia, so the yucca might be native to Virginia, but that seems like a stretch. The boxwood probably not. I'm not sure what shrub that is. Any other thoughts? The berm is bare. More plants to provide stabilization. Yes, I think these are generally bare. There is a lot of blank spaces in there that at the very least, someone in charge of maintenance is gonna have to come mulch all the time. And clearly some of this mulch is floating and heading to our overflow. And on this swale, as water comes down, they have the check dams that is great, but a lot of that mulch is gonna get moved and so will sediment. So a lot more plant coverage for both of these would be preferred. Ground cover. Many of you are gonna see this and hate this picture because I'm pretty sure it's a liriope, which is a common landscaping plant, but not native and has very little value other than it is a ground cover. But I like this picture because someone at least took the effort in and said, I'm not just gonna plant a few trees in my grass channel or dry swale. I'm gonna at least make sure there's ground cover. And the mulching effort on this is going to be a whole lot less than the pictures before. So. Ignore the plant I chose to show this picture of. There are a lot of native plants that can be used for ground cover. I'm gonna kick that question to Kate. I hope she has an answer for me. Otherwise, I'll do some quick research. You do have an answer for me. You're nodding, aren't you, Kate? Um, well, you can answer that when you're up for your case study, if that's all right. Um, I like, I love plants, but my plant design skills are somewhat limited for stormwater BMPs. Given my uh, plant design skills being limited, I do stick with this, consider a limited pallet guidance. I love this BMP over here. I think it's beautiful. I think despite its somewhat wild look, it probably took a lot of effort to get it looking like that. And it took someone who knew and what these probably 10 species of plants were and that they should stay um, and what the 10 species of other plants that grew up here and they didn't want shouldn't be there. So it took someone with some knowledge. Um, this design over here looks like it has four or five different plant types. And I could see giving it a, um, a few photos of plants to whoever was in charge of maintenance saying these are the ones that were supposed to be in here. And here's some pictures of common invasives that we expect we might find that need to be out. And it might give the maintenance 
person a little better chance of maintaining it, maintaining it how we want to see it. Another planting issue, plan for first and second year maintenance. Our plants are always gonna be smallest in the first and second years. They're gonna have the least developed root system. They're not gonna be as stable. They're not gonna be able to handle changes to the system as well as the older plants. So plan for more maintenance in the first and second years. These photos are of the same exact BMP, slightly different angle, but same BMP. This was after year one, this is after year three. That's a very different maintenance approach and a whole lot more effort on the weeding and the mulching and whatnot until you get the plants very established. Okay, that was the design portion. The second portion is still related to design, but I separated it out because there's some pro programmatic issues that can lead to maintenance problems. And programmatic issues and design issues are very closely related. One, thorough plan review. What is the issue in my photo here? And how could design or plan review have avoided this issue? This is permeable pavement, by the way, or at least was intended to be. Any thoughts? Better grading. Good answer. Better grading is kind of what I was looking for. This permeable pavement, you can't see it all from this photo, but this relatively small permeable pavement area was placed at the very low spot of a very large parking lot, which is great from a water, theoretically great from a water management point of view. After all, we put this expensive BMP in and let's capture as much water as we can. The trouble with that, especially with permeable pavement, is capturing as much water as we can means we're capturing as much sediment as we can. And permeable pavement cannot handle this much sediment without very frequent maintenance. So this is a design issue in that the BMP was put with, was installed with too large a contributing drainage area. But it's also a plan review issue that there should have, a programmatic issue and plan review issue that there should have been clear specifications that the city, county, or state, whoever's reviewing this has limits on how much contributing drainage area you can have and be enforcing those limits. When you look at the plan and say, no, this isn't, you know, this doesn't fit our rules. And the reason those rules are there is because things like this happen. So this one's both design and programmatic, I think. Oh, back to my picture. I think this one is, while we discussed talked about this as a micro-grading design issue. It's also a programmatic issue, again, with plan review. If this is what's being proposed, we better see a note on there that that stone is below the inlet. Next problem, records management. This is a, a slide I borrowed from a presentation in Montgomery County, Maryland, showing all of the steps they do to gather facility data and photos of their maintenance inspection visits and having the plans online. I'm hoping a lot of places have improved since I did that review back in 2009 of the James River BMPs, because most of the BMPs we looked at, the community knew the location, but that was it. They didn't have any plans for it, any photos, any logs of having visited it. Um, I saw some that had you know, sheds built on top of the BMP, that sort of thing. So if we want good maintenance, we need to keep track of where our BMPs are and what's happening with them. Inspection frequency. I would hazard a guess that these two BMPs have not been inspected by the whoever's in charge at the community very often. Um, that's a lot of sediment built up over time 
there doesn't appear to be regular inspection happening, which is a design problem, an owner problem, but with many BMPs, you know, if the community's not enforcing maintenance, it's not going to happen. All right, maintenance responsibility. I have designed many BMPs where it was not as clear as I would have would like it to have been of who was in charge of maintenance. And that is a shortcoming of mine as a designer. I've worked with many communities who don't make it clear who's in charge of maintenance, with it, which is a shortcoming for the program. This was the most um, egregious example I saw of it when I did that James River survey. This is an infiltration trench, or at least it was supposed to be. Actually, I take that back, an infiltration basin. There's coming from the parking lot, there's this curb cut. Well, someone at the church that this infiltration basin was installed at some point said, why do we have that low spot right in our front yard? And they put in an impermeable liner and filled it with decorative stone and then put a nice angel statue on top. And frankly, it looks nice, but it is serving no function for stormwater anymore. So we lost that BMP entirely, and it's going to be very hard for that community to come back and say, you have to remove your statue. That's our that's your stormwater BMP that you're supposed to take care of. So early, you know, early in the process, making it clear in every way that you can that property owners are responsible for maintenance is important, an important part of any stormwater program. So solutions, programmatic solutions. During plan review, check for key design features. Make sure BMP inspectors and plan reviewers talk to each other because BMP inspectors see things that plan reviewers never do. And that's an opportunity to change how plan review is happening. Include pre-treatment design options and details in the specification manual. Specify maintenance tasks in plans and agreements. Require maintenance agreement transfer with the deed on the property. Encourage or require establishment of, of a maintenance fund or an escrow account for BMPs. That one's a tough one to pull off, but it is a good practice. Similarly, require a performance bond to ensure the vegetation gets established. Uh, use a checklist for BMP inspection and maintain long-term records. Develop a strategy to resolve maintenance violations. That might be one of the most important ones on this list. Enforce non-compliance of maintenance in a timely manner before the angel statue is built, ideally. And provide training for maintenance inspectors. All right, so last slide for me is a test question. I think there are many right answers to this question. What design and programmatic issues contributed to this maintenance issue for this particular BMP? This was at one time a bioretention area. It does not seem to be functioning as such anymore. Poor sloping. Improper maintenance. Who is in charge of maintenance? My best guess on this one is there is a land, too much mulch, no poor bay. My best guess is there is a landscape firm that was contracted to maintain this BMP. Whether they knew it was a BMP or not, I don't know, but they kept filling mulch in until they filled the entire BMP. So a better plan that made it clear that this was a BMP that had plants in the bottom, so you couldn't just keep filling it with mulch. The inspection protocols that would catch this before what appears years of mulch was added. Educational signage saying this is stormwater BMP, don't fill it up. Um, perhaps a lack of specification for soil. Looks like, yes, this guy's working pretty hard to get his soil probe into the soil. I agree with that one well. 
So that's why I finished with this one, all kinds of design and programmatic issues. It's what makes me sad about this one is it appears in a good location. It's in the low point, there's curb cuts there. Like this could be a stormwater BMP. Someone put some design effort into this, but not, but missed some of the details to make sure that it would stay a functioning BMP as it got maintained over time. So let's go back to our take home points. Many BMP maintenance problems are design problems that we need to plan ahead for. Many BMP maintenance problems are programmatic problems that we need to plan ahead for when we develop our stormwater program. The sediment never disappears. It has to be physically removed by someone. Pretreatment is essential. Okay, I'm gonna jump right in to our case study with Kate Austin, who is the Green Infrastructure Asset Coordinator for the City of Lancaster. She, Kate manages the operations and maintenance practices of the city's award-winning green infrastructure installations, as well as managing the Small Stormwater Project Permitting Program. Kate is passionate about cultivating multifunctional, beautiful native urban landscapes to manage stormwater, provide habitat, and promote urban green. Kate is a graduate of the University of Georgia with a bachelor's degree in landscape architecture and Moravian College with a bachelor's degree in political science. In addition to her work at the city of Lancaster, Kate serves as president of the board of the Little Conestoga Watershed Alliance and board member of the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council. Kate, I'm going to let you share your screen and stop sharing mine. Looking forward to seeing your presentation. Great. Thanks so much, Greg. Let's see here. Just add some to the two, two, two. Yeah. One second, I'm gonna stop my share and figure out my screen because it covers up everything. Um, Great. Okay, here we go. All right, well, thanks for joining us, everyone. And thank you, Greg, for that fantastic introduction. And you really set the scene for a lot of the things that we have um, come across in uh, our years of developing our maintenance program here in Lancaster. Um, so we have been installing green infrastructure practices in the city of Lancaster um, for about 10 years now. Um, most of our installations uh, our early installations went in around 2011, 2012. And so here's just kind of some, uh, an, an array of the types of practices we're installing. We have um, a number of uh, curbside rain gardens throughout the city. We have porous pavements, uh, both in porous paver installations, um, porous asphalts, the basketball court um, here is a porous asphalt installation. Uh, we have a number of green roofs. I don't know if the number still stands, but um, the last I had heard, we had the most green roofs per capita in the country. Um, pays to be a small city, so we're only about 60,000 people. So, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so um, yeah. And then a number of um, uh, parking lot projects that we have greened um, uh, to try to manage runoff from our many, many surface parking lots. So just to kind of look at how our program has evolved over time, just a little background. Um, so as I mentioned, the city of Lancaster, we're a relatively small city, 60,000 people um, in uh, South Central Pennsylvania. 
Um, we're an old city. So um, we were established in 1744. And uh, so a lot of our infrastructure is quite old. We do have a combined sewer system. And that is really the driver behind our stormwater management program, trying to reduce the combined sewer overflows um, that happen um, that discharge into the Conestoga River. And so we have been uh, working on our green infrastructure program for um, since 2011. We uh, introduced our green infrastructure plan to address uh, our stormwater issues. In 2012, we established the stormwater ordinance um, and our bureau. Uh, we do have a utility fee, a stormwater utility fee here in the city. Um, so um, that applies to all properties um, in the city, uh, city properties included, um, as well as churches, nonprofits, all that good stuff. Um, and it's based on area of impervious. Um, in 2015, I started with the city and that's when we started our inspections and monitoring program. And, um, and then kind of hand in hand, that's also when we started identifying where we had um, some gaps in our maintenance program and, uh, and bring that more up to speed. And now we are continuing to grow um, and uh, we are uh, still consistently installing more and more projects every year. Yeah, so um, when we think about our green infrastructure program, I think one of the real strong points of our program is that we really look at it um, as an adaptive management uh, approach. So we really look at design, maintenance, and monitoring as a, um, a process, an iterative process that we kind of move between. So we take lessons that we learn in the field with our maintenance crews and communicate that information back to our designers, as well as um, information that we're learning through infiltration testing and uh, thinking about how to better maintain and better design our projects. So we have currently um, over 200 rain gardens in the city, both these curbside installations, um, as well as rain gardens in parks and other public spaces. Um, and these are all maintained by city staff. And we currently have a staff of three who are doing our maintenance. So as you can imagine, it's a lot of work for three people. So um, we are uh, doing our best to design these practices so they can be efficiently maintained and managed um, and function well. So some of the things that we look at in terms of inspections and monitoring. So we have a full-time inspector um, who inspects all of our green infrastructure installations uh, once, about once a month. And, um, and this is a really key piece to our maintenance program because our inspector is able to go out in the field, identify issues um, that she sees visually and work up a work order to send to our maintenance staff um, to address them in the field. So often these are issues that are going to get captured in our routine maintenance that our maintenance crew is doing. Um, I should note, we do have our three staff as a dedicated green infrastructure maintenance staff. They're in public works, but they are dedicated only to green infrastructure maintenance, um, which was a move when, uh, when I first started with the city they were just generally in our parks department and being pulled into other responsibilities. And we really identified that we needed uh, dedicated full-time staff um, looking specifically at green infrastructure. Um, so there is this, uh, this communication between the inspector and the, the maintenance staff kind of working closely to understand what the issues are um, in the field. And by being out so frequently, um, inspecting each of the practices once a month, we're really able to keep up with what is a reoccurring routine issue um, versus, um, you know, something that is a little bit more sporadic. Um, um, so um, in addition to the inspections, we are also doing infiltration testing um, on a five-year basis for each of the BMPs. And so uh, we want to be able to assess that things are functioning well. Um, if we are getting reduced infiltration rates over time, we can uh, assess what the issues might be and if there's some corrective actions that are needed. 
And with our inspections, um, we follow uh, follow a protocol that um, uh, that we largely pulled from the Chesapeake Stormwater Network. Had a visual guide to uh, to stormwater inspections a few years back. Um, we now have an asset management system that all of this is um, is collected through GIS. Um, but this is our paper copy of the form, and so these are the categories that we're looking at. So we're going to be inspecting our inlet zones, the perimeter areas, the bed of the uh, of the rain garden itself, looking at vegetation um, and how and how things are functioning through the outlet. Um, so um, by kind of having the systemized approach, we're making sure that we're capturing everything in each of the inspections. And uh, another key part of our program, we identified that there was really a need for training for all of our uh, grain infrastructure staff, um, from myself down to, you know, all of our uh, field maintenance staff. So all of us have gone through the Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professional Program um, and have, um, we all have the level one certification. Um, a few of us have the level two certification as well, which is for um, design and installation. And this has really helped get one, everyone on, uh, on even footing of understanding the why of why we're installing these practices, why we're maintaining these practices, um, and then also the how, what is so, what do we need to be focusing on in terms of maintenance, um, what plant species are functioning well. Um, and so it's been really helpful in bringing everybody up to a really high level of, um, of understanding and experience um, for these uh, specific facilities. Uh, we've also, we've hosted the training here in Lancaster, and it's also given us the opportunity to invite in a lot of the local contracting community. So it's not just the city that's installing grain infrastructure. We have many local contractors who are installing these practices on private properties. And so by bringing everyone's knowledge and skill level up, it really helps to have a more functional base of stormwater practices in the city. All right, so I wanna get into um, some of the nitty gritty of um, some of the lessons that we have learned over time uh, in some of our installations. So I'm gonna start with um, an installation that went in in 2012 at the intersection of Plum and Walnut Streets. Uh, if you're interested, if you're uh, familiar with the city of Lancaster, this is right outside the Lancaster Brewing Company on the east side of the city. And this is a before picture of what the intersection looks like. Um, uh, you can see there's this concrete merging median um, in the street. This uh, unfortunately uh, was a driver of a lot of uh, car accidents on this uh, in, at this intersection. This was the highest accident intersection in the city. And uh, so we knew that for safety reasons, for safety for drivers, bicyclists, pedestrians, we needed to do something about this intersection. Um, and it also posed a great opportunity to integrate green infrastructure as we were doing this major capital uh, project. Um, and that has really been how we have looked to fund a lot of our projects is how can we uh, leverage an existing capital project that we're bringing um, funds in and, uh, and couple that with green infrastructure work. So here was our, uh, uh, the, what we were starting with and this was the after. So we, work to uh, to slow down traffic speeds coming up Walnut Street. This is a major entryway into the city. And um, so by narrowing the driving lanes with large rain gardens on either side of the road, uh, we have uh, four major rain gardens in the area and also um, porous pavers. Uh, so these uh, angled parking spaces um, along the street are porous pavers as well as this patio area that is now outside of the Lancaster Brewing Company. And the city uh, entered an agreement with the brewing company that we would essentially allow them to utilize this as a patio space in exchange for maintaining it. Um, and that has worked really well. It's been a real boon for the restaurant and has been helpful for us in that they've been doing a great job of taking care of it over time. So this was all installed in 2012. Um, it was beautiful. Uh, it was, it is the, it still stands the only Pennsylvania winner of the Bubba Award, the best urban BMP in the Bay Award, which we're very proud of. It's very exciting. 
but it did not mean that we did not have some issues. Um, so unfortunately, so this was what our planting looked like um, immediately in, in the first year. Um, the planting palette was largely native shrubs. We had a lot of winterberry um, and there was a little bit of ground cover with some Pennsylvania natives. And sadly, almost all of our plants died in the first year, uh, which was uh, pretty disappointing since this was the biggest uh, new project that we had installed at that time. Um, and we identified a couple of issues. Um, one being um, that uh, this is a uh, major entryway into the city. It's a PennDOT road, and that means it gets salted a lot in the winter months. And so the salt uh, input into our green infrastructure was something we hadn't anticipated. And the plant species that we had selected were not terribly tolerant of salts. And um, so we think that was a major, major factor here. The other thing is just thinking about the soil media itself. Um, uh, these systems utilize bioretention soil, which is heavily sand-based um, and um, does not have a lot of organic matter. Um, so so the, uh, the plant species that were installed in these soils maybe needed a little bit more nutrients than they were getting from that bioretention soil. Um, this is also an extremely hot exposed area. So the, uh, the urban heat island effect of you know, uh, reflection off the roadway was definitely a factor as well. So we um, went back to the drawing board and we worked with uh, Claudia West, uh, who at the time was with North Creek Nurseries. Now she's with Fido Design Studio. And she um, put together a really beautiful planting palette. Um, and she pulled from plants that are native to the Mid-Atlantic, but maybe more so to coastal New Jersey and Delaware, um, which could handle the salt intake and could also handle the heat and the sandy soils. Um, these plants have performed beautifully. Um, we have really uh, not had trouble with them since installation. Um, and it is a fairly complex planting palette. There's about 40 species that are in here. Um, and over the years, some have outcompeted others. Um, but in terms of maintenance, uh, we have found it there to be a really simple tool. All of the plants that are installed here are about three and a half feet and under, um, mostly for visibility for cars coming up the up the street. And so when we get the odd plant, the odd weed that shoots up to five feet tall, our maintenance staff can immediately identify that that one's not supposed to be there. And so um, it's a real simple trick that has really helped our maintenance crew just kind of think through, okay, what belongs, what doesn't. So um, this has been really helpful. The other benefit here is um, Greg talked a bit about uh, mulch and just the, the maintenance input that mulch requires and the financial input that mulch requires. This system uh, utilizes no mulch. And uh, so that's not something that needs to be replaced. Uh, the plants themselves provide that ground cover, um, what we sometimes refer to as green mulch um, by densely covering the entire area. So another lesson that we uh, learned the hard way was thinking about adjacent surfaces to our BMP. So this uh, this alley here is a private alley that, and this is run. This is along the side of the Lancaster Brewing Company. So this is directly adjacent to um, to our porous pavement and our rain garden, and um, it was a not uh, not at all recently improved alley. Um, as a private alley, it's owned a, a, each adjoining property owner owns a percentage of the alley. So as you can imagine, bringing everyone together to agree to invest to repave the alley is not something that happens commonly. And we have a lot of these commonly owned private alleys in the city. Um, so we identified that this was really a problem for our green infrastructure and needed to be addressed even though it was private property, not in the public right of way. And so we developed a design and um, did outreach to all of the adjoining property owners who all had to sign on to landowner agreements to, in, to pave the alley. So this goes in a U shape and um, the, the legs that come down and join Walnut Street are standard asphalt. At the top of the alley is a porous asphalt. 
Um, and it has, so we got additional stormwater management function and stabilizing our site so that we didn't end up with a tremendous amount of sediment that was depositing into our rain gardens. Yeah, so Greg uh, showed this picture that uh, he'll, that you'll see here and, um, you know, kind of primed in and got exactly what the issue was here. This was a nightmare for our crew to maintain. And um, so this was something that uh, when I started doing inspections, it was always an issue that it was full of sediment. These stone cobbles had originally filled the entire, um, this entire pretreatment area and they were full to the brim of sediment. Um, it was a nightmare for our maintenance staff to clean out. Uh, in fact, the best suggestion that I had heard to clean out these stone cobbles was to bring out a big tarp and uh, some milk crates and load up the milk crates with the, uh, with the cobbles and then shake out all of the sediment and then redeposit them back into the system. Obviously that would have taken forever, been very labor intensive, and we have 200 of these things around the city. This was not gonna be a long-term solution that we, that we could work with. So we thought about how we could, um, how we could change this to make it more functional. Um, and so we uh, decided to do this concrete four bay and uh, remove a lot of the cobbles that were in the, uh, in the pretreatment area. Um, and this is what it looked like after. And, um, and so by creating this concrete four bay, um, which really, you know, honestly, it kind of goes against a lot of what we think about, you know, with, uh, with rain gardens and green infrastructure, we actually created more impervious area, but by creating this impervious area that we're uh, that we were able to just you know get in a flat edge shovel or even um, a vacuum attachment and just clean this out very easily um, makes it a lot more functional for the rest of the rain garden and it prevents this sediment from making its way into the rain garden which was a real issue we were having and then having to replace plants and soils as well um, so the other real benefit here is that it's highly visible. So when there is accumulation, like you see in the photo on the right, uh, our staff can easily see what's there and that it needs to be cleaned out. Um, and so, whereas, as you can imagine, the photo on the left, when there was more accumulation, it just kind of blended with what was already there and was already a problem that was gonna be an ordeal to clean out. So we've been really happy with, uh, with this installation. Um, it's worked really well. And so we, we also uh, replaced this in the larger rain garden down, down the street. Um, this was the uh, right after installation, this large channel of stone cobbles uh, had become completely and totally filled with sediment, largely from that alley that hadn't been improved. Um, and so it had actually created a dam that the water wasn't even getting into the larger rain garden bed. So we removed all of that. Uh, we installed this kind of pizza wedge shaped um, concrete four bay that has worked incredibly well. Um, you can see we also replanted many new plantings here and in the area right um, to the edge of the concrete four bay, we installed um, a planting matrix of juncus and, um, and, and uh, carex or sedge uh, planted very densely together. The two plants together are, they're very tough. They can handle the inundation of the sediments and the salts and um, provide this vegetative barrier. Um, so if anything gets past the, um, the pavers that are set for that toothed edge, they're gonna get captured by those dense plants and that has been functioning really well for us. So we did all of this work in house. We designed it in house and our public work staff did, uh, did all the work. Uh, I just wanted to show here, you can see how much sediment was built up. You can see the lighter colors, the bioretention soils and the dark soil is all of that sediment that was accumulated. And excavating out that area. Our crew did all the concrete work. They did a beautiful job on it. And they said, we just happened to have some extra pavers around the public works yard. And they worked really well to create this uh, toothed edge that helps to 
uh, trap sediment and leaves that uh, that enter the system, but also provide some energy dissipation and flow and slow down the flow of water as it enters the rain garden. Uh, but I will say that uh, it didn't solve all of our problems. This was maybe two weeks after we had completed this work, a vehicle driving too fast up the street ended up in our rain garden. And uh, so this is just to say that the work never ends. The maintenance never ends. So um, cars and rain gardens will continue to be a challenge for us. So yeah, and so Greg has shown this picture as well. Um, this is on Hershey Avenue. Um, we actually, the inspiration for this installation in the new design came from the uh, the retrofit work that we did on the design at Plum and Walnut. So we were in the design process on this project and originally it was um, it was going to have a very small four bay, uh, mostly with stone cobbles and uh, we were able to uh, talk with our designers and say, hey, these are the issues we were having. These are the changes we just had to make to um, to this other rain garden. Um, can we install this um, in the in the new design? And so we did uh, because there is a very large drainage area coming into this rain garden. It's a large rain garden. Uh, we have a tiered system of uh, the concrete four bay, and so it steps down and has the this nice toothed edge along it to help to slow down the water and drop out that sediment before it gets into the rain garden area. So um, a, an additional uh, new technology that our field staff have developed um, are the use of filtration stocks within the concrete four bays. Um, so um, they have been uh, basically uh, creating them and installing them in-house. Um, our uh, maintenance operator went to Joanne Fabrics, bought some mesh, um, in, put in some wood chips, um, and to size them exactly um, to go from wall to wall of the four bays. And uh, the idea was to capture fine sediment before it's entering the system. We were noticing that a lot of the fine sediment was still making its way past that, um, that paver toothed edge. And we wanted something to, uh, to try to uh, intercept that. Um, once the sock is full of sediment, it can be removed and replaced. Um, they're very inexpensive and they work really well uh, within the four bay. And the major benefit that we have seen that we didn't quite anticipate was we have seen a dramatic reduction in weed accumulation in the rain gardens because we're actually intercepting those weed seeds before they make it in. And so that has been really beneficial. So. Kate, is that reusable mesh that the wood chips get dumped and fresh put in? Sorry, was our question? Yes, sorry. Yes. I, very good video. Is that you reusable mesh that the wood chips get dumped when they're full? And yeah, so it, it can be if if mesh has not become torn, um, it yes, it absolutely can be uh, just dumped out and then and then refilled. Uh, very very inexpensive and easy to do, and um, yeah, and so in Frisco, who was uh, leading, who was uh, speaking in the video there, he really developed this. This was 
a problem that we identified and um, he started thinking about, okay, what's a, you know, what's a simple intervention that we can do that can uh, reduce this problem. And so, um, and he's been studying them out in every rainstorm since then. So um, it's been really great. Yeah. So this is another, um, I, an, another thing that we are piloting right now in the city is um, uh, installing paver four bays. Um, and so this is another kind of experiment with our green infrastructure maintenance team uh, looking at if it is if, if it's possible to utilize pavers for these four bay areas rather than poured concrete. Um, it's easier for our crew to install um, uh, and it is, um, and if we do have an issue, it's easier to pull out the papers and address what might be happening beneath and then reinstall. We're seeing how this works. We have just started uh, installing these, uh, these types of four bays in the last year. I have concerns that we might end up having some of the same maintenance headaches that we had with the stone cobbles that uh, the sediment and debris accumulates between the pavers, um, but this would be a bit easier to remove and reinstall, um, but we will, it will be, remain to be seen how well this works for us. Um, so far, so good. They've been functioning well. It also provides some additional energy dissipation with the water coming in because it's going across the uneven surface of the, uh, the stone cobbles. Um, but it's something that we're just very encouraging of with our entire team is trying out new, uh, new possible uh, interventions and see what works and what doesn't. And, um, and so we are hoping that we will find that this will be another successful way to, uh, to address sediment. So another project that we uh, needed to deal with uh, some uh, some issues that it wasn't functioning the way that it needed to uh, was at Crystal Park. So this was another early installation. This was also installed in 2012. Um, this is at a, um, a public park in the city and um, where there are a number of rain gardens and you can see um, some of these photos. We Vegetation was not doing well. We had a lot of um, a lot of sediment that was building up and we had issues with the flow paths going through the rain gardens that it was not uh, flowing the way that it was intended to. So this is what it looked like in a rain event. You can see we have almost no vegetation remaining in here. Um, we had identified that part of the issue was shade. We have some large sycamore trees in the area. The other issue was vandalism. We had a lot of um, uh, plants that were pulled out and um, and we did identify our vandals. Uh, they, we had, we have cameras in the park and uh, it was largely our vandals were under the age of five. Uh, young kids were just having a great time pulling plugs out of the rain garden. <laughs> so we, uh, we knew that we were going to have to replant and, um, and also talk with neighbors a little bit about their ideas that they had around how to make sure that the plant stayed in the ground to just kind of uh, keep eyes on the area. Um, so we also had some issues you can see in the picture on the right with uh, outlet heights. So the there's you can see the domed riser and then the 24 by 36 um, inlet structure that were are both intended to serve as um, as overflow structures for the rain garden. They were installed improperly. And so the 24 by 36 inlet grate, was actually installed higher than the curb, the top of curb. And so we never had water able to overflow into that system. And instead it was cresting over the curb and then running into the intersection and running down the street where we were already having some localized flooding issues. So it really was just not doing the job we needed to do. So we looked at the original design and what we wanted to, uh, uh, to do to address it. So we wanted to install more of the concrete sediment four bays. Um, 
We also wanted to look at removing as much of the uh, geotextile fabric that had been installed beneath the soils, um, the concern that they were actually clogging and uh, not allowing the level of infiltration that we that we wanted to see. Um, we, in the larger rain garden, we identified that the outlet actually needed to be raised. It was set too low and, um, and installed a level spreader that also served as a little, a narrow crosswalk because people were cutting through the rain garden and kind of stepping in it. So by uh, installing something that people could walk across, that helped. Um, and so we replaced the soils in each of the rain gardens here um, and adjusted those outlet heights. And this is what it looked like um, when we were getting ready for planting, fully replanted um, with, um, with species that could handle part sun conditions, um, could also um, handle some salt load because there's salting uh, on the roads here as well. Um, and uh, and things perform really well. So we have a lot more of the, the Juncus and the Sedge um, combination that works really well to intercept some of that sediment. And we have closest to the, um, the concrete four bay. Um, and so, yeah, it all came together well. So this last example I just wanna talk about is that sometimes the maintenance correction is not as involved and doesn't involve as much of the, um, uh, you know, co a complete re-engineering as some of the other projects. So this was over at Rodney Park. We just noticed that a lot of the vegetation was just not performing well, uh, but the water seemed to be entering the garden as it needed to be, just for whatever reason, the, the vegetation had not thrived. Um, so this really just required a simple replanting uh, we looked at the species that were performing there well already and introduced uh, more ground cover and herbaceous species. And so it has turned into just a really lovely planting. Uh, we replanted in 2018 and it has just continued to do very, really well. Um, so got some really nice uh, spring color there. And uh, so sometimes, you know, the, it's not, not as complex as, um, as some of the other issues, and that's always a relief. So the lessons that we've learned over time is um, choosing appropriate plant material for the site, um, you know, whether it needs to be shade tolerant, uh, salt tolerant, uh, all, you know, or if you're dealing with leaner soils with bioretention soils considering adjacent surfaces um, uh, in the surrounding area. Anything that's in that drainage area is going to be affecting your, your practice. And so you wanna be taking it into account, um, designing with future maintenance in mind, making it as uh, legible and simple as possible in the field. Those regular inspections are really key. Um, and then if a system isn't working, find out why. Talk to your field staff, they are going to know well what's what's happening on a regular basis and uh, and make sure that the lessons that they're learning are getting communicated to the engineers, to the landscape architects um, and uh, and the other management staff. Um, the other tough lesson is that finding the money to fix the installations when they're not working is a lot more challenging than finding the money to put them in in the first place. And so um, that's where we have been looking for these low cost in-house interventions. And yeah, with that, thank you very much, everyone. Yeah, I'll take some questions. Thank you so much, Kate, that was great. Lee, would you like to do questions now or? Sure, I think, um, I think what would be best is if, no, my video. Um, if folks wanna start adding their questions to the chat box, uh, both questions for Greg and for Kate, and we can go through, uh, go through those questions. Feel free to take yourself off mute and or raise your hand. We can uh, answer questions that way as well. Um, the intention of this training is to be interactive with your presenters and ask the questions that are you know difficult things that you're facing with your in your job. So 
Um, so please feel free to ask questions. And I will start by just reading off some that have come up. Um, one from Daniel Moyer, how much maintenance is needed by staff weekly? Yeah, so our our staff, our, our, our maintenance staff are full-time. So we have, um, we have three full-time maintenance staff and on a weekly basis, um, they are uh, a, a regular activity is vacuuming out the inlets that are associated with the green infrastructure. And um, so that is a, a regular activity. Uh, trash cleanup, rain gardens in particular accumulate a lot of a lot of trash, um, and so uh, cleaning that out is important. Um, sediment removal is a uh, is really important um, and a fairly regular task. Uh, but those are probably the biggest ones. We do have, um, you know, replantings from time to time, and um, and uh, you know other uh, other more involved maintenance activities, but um, but those regular everyday practices is kind of what keeps us from having to do the major overhaul, overhaul down the line. Next question we have is, how do you train staff for maintenance? Is there an out of box training program you utilize? Yeah, I mean, I can speak to the program that we've all gone through. Um, it's through the Chesapeake Conservation Landscaping Council, um, and it's called Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professional. They have started offering it outside of the Chesapeake Bay watershed as well. Um, and um, we have found it just really effective and helpful for our staff. The other thing I like about it is it kind of creates a community of practitioners. So if there are questions any one of us can, you know, ask other people who've been through the program and, um, and yeah, get, you know, get tips and tricks of what has worked in other places. Um, so that's been, that's been really helpful. Um, but there are a number of other training programs that are out there. Um, I would say there's not enough of them, um, but, um, but yeah, they're starting to be more and more. Thank you. And I'll use this opportunity to, for a shameless plug, um, the Center for Watershed Protection also has the Clean Water Certificate Training Program, where we do training for field crews that do um, construction and maintenance of green infrastructure. So if you have any questions about that, feel free to reach out to me separately. Um, okay, so Kate, what has been the most difficult part of the historic designation of Lancaster City? Oh, in terms of stormwater, it's definitely our combined sewer system. Well, I mean, it's in in some it, in some instances, it's a blessing and a curse. I mean, so um, you know, originally the combined sewer system, which just so everyone understands, um, the when we have a rain event, the inlets that are uh, on the street collect the stormwater and it combines into the same pipe as our sewage, and so both sewage and stormwater are in a typical rain event, everything goes to the wastewater treatment plant, everything gets treated before it discharges to the river. So in some ways, it can be great. It's just when we have heavier rain events that happen more and more frequently that we have, uh, when the system it overflows with too much water in the system, it discharges untreated stormwater and sewage directly into the Conestoga River. So that that is our biggest challenge um, that we have here in the city is reducing those overflows. Um, and, uh, and so that's why we're installing green infrastructure to kind of act as sponges all over the city to absorb it rather than going into our uh, combined system. Thank you. So Kate, a lot of questions are coming in for you. So I will give you sure. a quick break to, <laughs> <laughs> to breathe um, as you just, uh, finish your presentation. So I'm going to turn this question over to Greg. Um, what is the average lifetime for a BMP, particularly by retention? How long uh, do they, can they function with proper maintenance? So you're giving me the tough ones. Exactly. <laughs> the, I don't think we have good data on that yet. Um, there's a lot, you know, different estimates, you know, 15, 20, 30 years. I don't think, or with proper maintenance, I think a bioretention area can last indefinitely because you know the sediment is going to be what kills it, um, but the sediment can be removed periodically. And 
one of the most useful things or the reasons we like plants in bioretention areas is the root growth and depth keeps the soil, keeps water flowing through the soil. It creates pathways for infiltration. So if we keep healthy plants and keep this and keep removing the sediment, I don't see any reason why a bioretention could not last indefinitely. All right, thank you. Um, did you want to add anything to that, Kate? Yeah, no, I think I, I agree. Um, yeah, we, we have on our, for our private installations, the agreement um, is typically 40 years um, is the, the estimate, but I totally agree that, you know, with proper maintenance and care that uh, it's, it should be able to last longer than that. Okay, so to segue into your next question, Kate. Can you speak to any differences between stormwater practices built and maintained in-house versus those on private property built by contractors and maintained by property owners? Yeah, absolutely. Um, there is, um, I would say there's, there's a range. I mean, in some cases, there are private installations that are installed by wonderful contractors, well-designed. Um, that are getting even more maintenance and care than uh, than we can provide to our uh, to our public BMPs, and um, so they can. Uh, many times, they're really seen as kind of an aesthetic asset for the business, and so they invest a lot into keeping them looking good and functioning well, and it's fabulous. On the other side of the spectrum, sometimes uh, there are practices that are installed because they're just required to be. So with our, um, our stormwater ordinance, we require the installation of some kind of a stormwater management practice for the installation of new impervious over 100 square feet. So somebody's putting a shed in the backyard, they're going to have to put in an infiltration trench or a rain garden or something like that. Um, and there I see, unfortunately, too many instances that uh, maybe a house is being flipped, the contractor applies for the stormwater permit, they install the practice, and they never communicate to the new property owner that this even exists and it doesn't get the care that it needs. Um, and so that's something that we're trying to figure out how to, especially with that uh, property turnover issue, um, how to get that information communicated to the new property owner. So we've talked about, um, you know, kind of keeping an eye on real estate turnover in the city and sending out notices when we see a property has sold, uh, we have not had the capacity to keep up with that currently. And so that that can be a real challenge, but um, but it can be a real range. Um, and um, and so it's, it's always great to see uh, when we have uh, private property owners who really uh, take a lot of pride in the practice they have. There's a church in the city that we did a, it was a private public partnership project um, and they redid their parking lot area and installed some porous asphalt and rain gardens. And they have a committee at the church that has adopted the rain gardens. They have plant signage. They have, they introduce new native species every year. Um, and it's, it's wonderful. It's one of my favorite spots to bring, uh, to bring groups to see a, you know, a great example of a practice. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, it can be taken care of really well. And uh, another question for you, Kate. Yeah. Um, how have you dealt with hesitant field and office staff that were skeptical and not on board with this concept of green infrastructure and only saw it as added responsibility? That's a great question. And that's something that we still struggle with, honestly, um, because um, it's, you know, we have, we now have built a really wonderful core staff that is doing the maintenance of these, uh, of these practices, but the, uh, you know, the, the work of many of departments otherwise in public works, you know, it intersects with our grain infrastructure work. Um, we've had an issue this winter with, um, you know, some reduced leaf pickup by our streets department that is impacting our green infrastructure. And so having those conversations about why we're doing this, why we're doing this work, why it's important I have found to be the most effective in helping to turn people around who are a little bit more resistant because a lot of a lot of people just don't 
they just don't know. They just think that, oh, this is some new trendy thing or whatever that you're putting in. And they don't understand that, um, you know, that it's part of this large effort to improve our water quality. I mean, a lot of people don't even understand that the rain gardens are to capture stormwater. They think that they're just, you know, garden areas. And so um, uh, making sure that people understand that, I think, um, and, uh, and answering questions, I think, is the, the best way that I have found to bring people around. Okay, and this one, I'm going to open it up to both of you. Um, Greg, it's another toughie, so um, <laughs> we can take a little bit of this, but um, what are the installation costs per gallon of stormwater detained or infiltrated? Um, so basically the cost benefit for different BMPs and, um, and the same for the maintenance costs per BMP. And I know this, maybe it's just sharing of resources that can help identify the costs. Um, and benefits for different BMPs, but do you have any? There, I don't have, I can't quote a cost for installation off the top of my head, um, but there are two really good resources. Um, there is, if you look up King and Hagen stormwater, there, that was a report done for the Chesapeake Bay looking at, um, stormwater uh, costs for all different types of BMPs. Um, so King and Hagen, H-A-G-E-N, stormwater, you'll find that cost study. There's another um, source that CWP actually wrote and borrowed a lot from King and Hagen um, called the James River BMP Cost Study. And if you look that up, you'll find, you'll find your way to CDFP's website um, and our online watershed library has that study. Um, that, is, that particular study breaks all the BMPs down by cost per pound of phosphorus removed and I think cost per acre treated as well. Um, so those are particularly handy. Um, I have my own things I've heard about maintenance costs, but I'd rather Kate ask answer the maintenance cost question. Yeah, um, yeah, no, that's, that's a good question. Um, so this is something that we've actually been looking to track with our asset management system and we haven't gotten there quite yet. Um, uh, but we, what we plan to be tracking is not just the maintenance activity that's occurring, the amount of time it's taking, how many staff, but also what vehicle are they using? What equipment are they using? Um, you know, time to travel out there, all that good stuff. And um, and so we hope to be able to get a snapshot then of what the what it's actually costing. Um, I think generally what we have found and what a lot of other communities are finding is that the maintenance costs are far higher than were originally estimated. Um, there, I know a lot of the guidance that. Uh, that I was given when I first started with the city were things like porous pavement only needs to be vacuumed twice a year. We have found that that is not the case at all, that it needs monthly vacuuming um, in, you know, anywhere that doesn't have um, or that does have any kind of tree cover over it. It absolutely needs um, uh, more regular vacuum sweeping than, than that. Um, you know, some of the early guidance was also that rain gardens only needed maintenance, you know, um, a couple times a year, maybe once a quarter. And we have found that they need more than that. And so, um, uh, so being able to really create a picture of, um, of, you know, what the, the real costs are. We did an analysis. Um, we developed an operations and maintenance manual in 2018, and we did an assessment of all of the different maintenance tasks that we were currently doing. Our current staffing levels at that point, we only had two full-time staff and, um, and we measured it out at that point that we needed four full-time staff to accomplish all of the tasks that, uh, that were needed. Um, and, uh, and I would say that it, that has only grown as our number of projects has grown and, uh, you know, costs have grown, all that good stuff. So, um, but that, if anyone's interested, that operations and maintenance manual is available on our website. It's uh, cityoflancasterpa.gov. Um, 
and uh, we have a, a design manual, an operations and maintenance manual, and a an, uh, monitoring guide. As a follow-up to that, Kate, um, do you have any experience with green roofs as a BMP um, in terms of effectiveness and maintenance requirements um, compared to on-the-ground BMPs? Yeah, so we have we have a number of green roofs in the city, and they're even older than a lot of our rain gardens. Um, the county had received funding in 2008, I believe, um, for green roof installations. And so we installed a number at our wastewater treatment plant um, on City Hall and on a couple of our fire stations. And, um, and they are certainly not maintenance free, but I have been really impressed at how well they have held up over time. Um, they, we do, um, yeah, weeding, we usually do, it's usually one big weeding event, I would say in, uh, in early summer and then some maintenance weeding after that. Um, um, they, uh, we are looking into, um, doing uh, some um, soil testing to see if we need to uh, replace any nutrients uh, just because it is such a, a lean soil mix on the green roofs. Ours are extensive roofs that are mostly gravel. Um, and so that's something that, um, that I've learned recently that is available that you can get the soil testing done to assess if you need to um, add any amendments. Um, but um, but yeah, um, but certainly weed seeds blow in, birds deposit weed seeds. Um, you know, there's lots of, uh, lots of issues there, but they don't get so much the trash blown in. Um, people aren't walking through them generally, that kind of thing. So they're a little bit more protected. So um, yeah. Want to add with green roofs that just like all the other VMPs we talked about today, all the green infrastructure VMPs, the first few years after construction are when the most maintenance is going to be needed, especially with kind of slow growing sedums. That's when weeds can really take off is early. Once the sedums start to spread, there's less room for weeds to grow. Yeah, for um, sure. I was just gonna add, they also need watering in the first few years, which is something that a lot of people don't think about because they're such you know, drought tolerant species generally, but they do need it sometimes. Um, I have a couple questions here, Kate, about collaboration and education. Mm -hmm. um, a couple of organizations, uh, the Native Plant Society chapters or UPenn Extension offices, there's a question if you've collaborated with either of them. And then also experience you've had with sponsoring any public engagement to let city residents know about stormwater regulations. Yeah, absolutely. So we we do a lot of public engagement, um, and um, so we um, have done everything from leading walking tours in the community. In the beginning of the program, we. Um, we led a lot of community workshops to introduce these these practices to um, to residents. So we were installing our early demonstration projects in a lot of public parks. Um, one because our parks needed updating, but two because they were highly visible and we could engage uh, engage the public in those. And um, and so um, yeah, those those workshops have been really critical, and I would say that they continue to be so as the program uh, grows and evolves. Um, and um, so we do partner with a lot of local organizations on uh, on engagement activities. There is a week long water celebration called Lancaster Water Week um, that is um, hosted by the Lancaster Conservancy. Uh, we've been a partner on that since the, the beginning. I think we're going into the sixth year, I believe. Um, and, um, and so that is a week of events that engage the public in all manner of water quality projects. So in the city, sometimes we'll do bike tours or walking tours, um, river cleanups, uh, neighborhood cleanups, um, uh, rain garden workshops, all kinds of good stuff. Um, but it's happening throughout the county. So there's also tours of preserved farms and uh, agricultural practices um, uh, on farms. 
um, and riparian buffers and all kinds of good stuff. And so, um, so I especially love that series of events because it puts the work that we're doing in the city in the context of like the bigger picture of everything that's happening throughout the county. And, um, and so that we're kind of a, a piece of the puzzle of addressing water quality, not the only answer. Um, but um, yeah, I think public engagement is, is really key. Um, we do we do work with um, uh, Penn State Extension um, often, and um, as well as Chesapeake Bay Foundation, the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. There's um, yeah, um, and then uh, also local arts organizations. Uh, that has been a really fun way to engage the public. We uh, recently, this past year, we did a public art project um, uh, painting murals uh, adjacent to storm drains. Um, and so engaging local artists and doing that. So that was a really cool activity. I always like to throw this question out when we get a group of people together who work on um, green infrastructure. But if anyone else has some um, experience with public engagement that they think was very successful, um, please share in the chat box. I think folks would really like to learn from each other because this is something that, you know, we're still new on engaging the public and educating the public about these practices. So any ideas are great to share in a group like this. Um, I have a question for either one of you. Are there any plants besides sedum that are um, typically used for green roofs? This is a follow-up from the previous green roof question. It depends on the soil depth. Um, if you have an extensive roof that's four inch, you know, around four inches of media, it is almost exclusively sedums that are used. I think there are a few other plants, but almost exclusively sedums. But green roofs can go up to 12, 24 inches, even more. And when you add those soil, that depth of soil, there's a lot more possibilities for what plants can be done. Um, I do a lot of work in Washington, DC, and there are several private properties that will put trees on their green roofs. Um, I don't know how well all of them do, but some of them do have enough soil depth to make it work. Um, next question is about buyer retention. Um, how often do we need to replace filter media for bioretention to make it work efficiently? And then um, I guess this is also a follow-up, sorry, to green roofs. How do we deal with erosion during heavy rainfall for green roofs? So you can decide if you want to tackle the green roof question first or- I'll do the green roof question retention. first because okay. we're uh, on the green roof topic. Um, I think the best way to deal with erosion on green roofs is to limit the amount of impervious cover that is draining to the green roofs. Green roofs do best when it is just the rain that falls on the green roof. Um, you can drain other areas to a green roof, but a lot more effort needs to be put in to spread that water out and not have it all come in in a single point. Um, the other thing to do is with green roofs is good roof drain design. Uh, the roof, there should be flashing or vertical walls around the any roof drains that keep the media from flowing into the roof drains. And that, that keeps, you know, the green roof is generally quite flat. And if there's no way for sediment to flow to the roof drains, there should be minimal erosion. And then regarding filter media for bioretention areas, if it's done right the first time and maintained well, you should never have to replace the media. The, again, the plant root growth will keep water flowing through the media for a long, long time. And most of the filtering happens by removing the sediment. If we remove the sediment, we remove the phosphorus that comes in and you know, the bioretention media is just kind of doing that final cleanup. So it shouldn't, you know, it shouldn't clog down more than a few inches down and, you know, should continue to function as intended. Great, thank you. Um, we have a request here, Kate. 
if you have any photos to share of the murals near the storm drains. So I, yeah, I, I don't have any right off the top of like <laughs> right in my slides, but I'm happy to happy to send those on because uh, yeah, they're pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah. If you want to share them with me, I can uh, share, use them in the follow up email. Yeah, well, that's great. Cool. Um, so also a comment here from Don uh, Giambalvo. I'm really apologize if I pronounced your last name incorrectly, um, but she shared some really great ideas about uh, public engagement. Um, so in underserved areas, communication through libraries, schools, local cafes, plus um, effective physical flyers, and then also uh, providing childcare, kids activities, and dinner at public meetings uh, enables more people to attend. So excellent. So when you're doing engagement activities, thinking through um, how to remove obstacles to individuals getting to these public engagement events, that's excellent advice. Um, so we have uh, nine minutes left of the training. What I want to do is open up the quiz. So again, if you are doing a, or if you would like a CEU or PDH certificate following this event, um, you do have to take this quiz. And it's also a great way to just check your knowledge. Um, so I'm gonna launch this poll, this uh, quiz. It will it'll look like a pop-up poll on your screen. Uh, go ahead and take it and um, take your time. It'll be open until the end of the training. So, all right, that, the quiz is launched. Um, we are still open to take a couple more questions and then I have some closing slides. So do we have any final questions? Feel free to raise your hand or put them in the chat box. We have another good suggestion about offering paid internships. Um, which engages youth in maintenance activities. We also have, um, as I mentioned earlier, our Clean Water Certificate Training Program, um, some of the workforce development organizations that teach the technical training will offer internships um, as a partner in parallel with our technical training. And so workforce development internships have um, also been a very successful way to engage individuals into starting a career in green infrastructure. All right, well, while you are thinking of any last minute questions, I'm going to go through a couple final slides. Um, Let's see, I'm going to share my screen with you. All right, so thank you so much, Greg and Kate, for this excellent training. Um, just so you all, or just to remind you, this is the second training in a series. The next training that is coming up next week is called Green Stormwater Infrastructure Maintenance. So today we focus more on the design for effective maintenance, but next week we're gonna look at um, routine maintenance. As we, without routine maintenance, green stormwater infrastructure practices are likely to fail. So maintenance is also typically required for local or state governments. Uh, this training will review examples of maintenance activities both routine and restorative for a variety of stormwater practices. So I think this is gonna be a really great follow-up to today's training. And we will hear from both Carol Wong, who's a senior water resources engineer at the Center for Watershed Protection, and Thomas Flynn, who's a um, environmental specialist from the township of, township of Woodbridge, New Jersey. So I hope you will join us for that training if you um, have any trouble registering, please just reach out to me. And I'd also like to remind you of the drop-in office hours. Um, so if you have any follow-up questions from this training, it's a really great opportunity to, 
sit down with Greg and um, ask any questions. It will be an hour, very casual drop in when you have the time. Um, but as a reminder, it's not a follow up training. This is really an opportunity just to have some a smaller group discussion with our presenter. And as a follow up, um, I would like you to take a feedback survey if you um, wouldn't mind. We are doing this training. This is the second virtual training series that the center has launched. And we would like to provide more of this training, especially since uh, folks are becoming more comfortable with the virtual format of training. Um, so if you can just tell us what we did right, any um, constructive criticism to improve our training opportunities for the future, and also any ideas for training topics. We'd love to hear that from you. So I'll place the survey link in the chat box. And so if you could take that survey and let us know how we did, we'd appreciate that. Um, also, if you can't make the office hours, um, feel free to reach out to our presenters directly. I'll share their contact information on the final slide. Um, and, uh, and also, you know, the office hours that are gonna be happening every week. If you wanna meet another one of our staff members, um, feel free to bring any questions to those other future office hours. Um, also, you can check out a resource sheet. This was curated by, um, by your presenters today and have some resources that um, might help you in design with, with maintenance in mind and your future considerations for, for design. Um, and then lastly, the reminder, if you do want a PDH or CEU, send me that uh, request, just shoot me an email by the end of the day, and I will get you those certificates within the week. I'd also like to talk to you briefly about joining our network. So this is an example of the training opportunities that we offer uh, throughout the net, through, or for our professional network. Um, we also offer lunch and learns and webcast almost monthly. So we have other training opportunities that uh, provide our professional network with ways to learn and share what their experiences are, um, the research they're conducting, uh, techniques that they found successful from different municipalities and uh, an opportunity to learn from each other. We also have discounted conference rates our national conference is coming up in April and it's gonna be in San Diego. And if you are a member, you do get a significant discount for registration. We also have an online watershed library. I shared a couple links, the um, resources that Greg mentioned previously. Um, I shared them in the chat box, but we also have 2000 plus resources available in our online watershed library. So our members have access to that. and other types of professional networking opportunities. So I'd definitely recommend considering uh, joining our network. And if you do have any questions, our director of membership and training, Karen Titus, would be happy to speak to you about this. So here is contact information for both Greg Hoffman and Kate Austin. If you have any of those follow-up questions, um, I, like I said, we'll share the feedback survey in the chat box. Um, it looks like we have about a minute left. So if anyone still wants to take that quiz, uh, you're gonna wanna wrap that up and um, I'll open up to any last minute questions. All right, if there aren't any, any more questions, I just wanna say thank you again to Kate Austin for joining us and Greg for an excellent presentation. Um, I think it was, we already heard, this was very informative and very helpful in the chat box. So um, we really hope to offer you additional support uh, as the series continues. So if you, um, if someone wasn't able to join us, tell them to check it out on our YouTube channel the Center for Watershed Protection YouTube channel. I'll share that in a follow-up email. Um, and have a nice week. Thank you, Lee. Thanks so much.